We're very pleased uh, today to have visiting us from Case Western Reserve University, Alexis Abramson. Alexis is the F. Alex Nason Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, she also is director of the Great Lakes Energy Institute, sort of Case's Scott Institute, if you will. Uh, she also directs a, a nano engineering center at Case Western Reserve. Um, during 2011 and 13, uh, Alexis took leave from Case to serve as the chief scientist to the Building Technologies Office at uh, USDOE. She received her bachelor's and master's from Tufts, her PhD from Berkeley, and we're very pleased that she made the drive up here, down here today. Welcome, Alexis. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm certainly happy to be here. Uh, the drives, it's an easy drive, and, uh, and to, it's, it's good to see my energy friends uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, as well as many of you. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, energy today, particularly how energy is being transformed. And I want to start by talking about energy with respect to the economy, because Great economies rely on energy. That independent uh, economic activity and expanded commercial exchange relies on having a reliable and robust energy ecosystem. In fact, I would argue that our energy infrastructure is really the single most important feature of a healthy, robust economy. I even like to think of our energy ecosystem, which really looks quite different from what it did uh, just a decade ago, that, that that energy ecosystem is really the lifeblood circulating through our economy, that it's the nourishment that is used to convert nature's bounty into the engineered goods and services that you and I use uh, every day. And so having a robust and reliable um, and innovative energy ecosystem is really what will continue to keep our economy alive and growing. In fact, uh, the World uh, Economic Forum recently said that the climate crisis is our number one risk to the global economy. And certainly, uh, our energy ecosystem is key to that. So let's think about taking all of the components in our energy ecosystem from generation to consumption. And let's think about what's happening to them. Well, there are a lot more of them than there were. We're starting to embed a bit more intelligence into all of these different devices. We're starting to connect them together. And as a result, we are transforming our energy ecosystem. So like the IT revolution um, and the industrial re revolution before it, I'd like to argue that we are in the midst of a smart energy revolution. Um, that is dramatically changing the way that we work and live. So let's think for a second about where we are today and, and where we're heading. So today, centralized power generation, 100% of us in this room rely on centralized power generation, maybe not for 100% of what we do, um, but it is key to our lives currently. It certainly was key to our lives in the decades before. Um, and how that works, it, I'm sure many of you in this room understand this, but the light coming out of these fixtures right here was, was actually generated just moments ago, and I'm guessing likely from a power plant, a centralized power plant somewhere. And the way that works is that demand must be in constant balance with supply. So if instead something went wrong and the tens of megawatts stopped pouring into uh, the grid, the distribution um, here on this campus, then you know somewhere along the way we might be able to redistribute or else the lights would just go off. Um, and this reminds me of the blackout in two, of 2003 when the lights went off for three days or so. Um, and because of a problem that originated in my hometown of, of, of Cleveland, Ohio, when thousands of megawatts stopped pouring into the grid. Uh, and that was because of a software bug and operators were unaware and unable to kind of redistribute the power from other places and really manage the fact that an overloaded power line had hit an unpruned tree. 
And I think that that day was really a wake-up call for all of us, that we have an aging, insecure, and inefficient grid. And it's about time we did something about it. Because really our grid, I like to think of it as a big machine, but really based on 20th century technology. How would you like it if your car that you drove here today and was based on only 20th century technology? Not very smart. And as we think about that energy ecosystem and all the devices connected to it, they too, even though they're modern and in some cases innovative and modern devices, they too lack all of the requirements we need to truly achieve the optimized operation, to deal with all these different scenarios like the emergency uh, conditions uh, or the, uh, that we run into today sometimes in various parts of the country and that will only be increasing in our future. So think about that. Think about that aging infrastructure and all these devices now connected to it, smart, some of them smart, some of them getting smarter. And juxtaposed next to that, let's think about what else is changing in that energy ecosystem, right? So energy costs in some parts of our country are rising quite a bit. Um, we have to deal with peak pricing issues in some parts of the country. We mentioned distributed resources. But also, what's changing is that your relationship with energy is very different than what it was a decade ago, right? Probably many of us in this room think of energy, our relationship with energy as really the, ut the monthly utility bill that we get. And maybe we actually know how many kilowatt hours uh, we use every month. Um, but more and more, we're starting to have choice when it comes to energy. We're starting to be able to pick whether or not we want this natural gas company or another. We're starting to be able to decide whether or not we want wind as part of our, a mix of our electricity that's coming to our home. Even when you walk into uh, Sears to buy a new refrigerator, you're having an interaction with energy that you didn't before. You're choosing whether or not to actually uh, choose an Energy Star rated refrigerator, and I hope that you do. Um, certainly LEED certification on buildings as well has overtaken the real estate market. That new construction now, it's unusual not to have some kind of Energy Star or LEED certified building. So we're starting to see this different relationship now with energy and the consumer and you, very different from how it was in the past. So when you put all these things together, I think that we really are at an inflection point right now in the way that we generate and transmit and distribute our energy. And I would argue there's really three main uh, critical components driving that change. The first, perhaps not so surprising, is what I'll call super connectivity. So this image is not really an infusion of stars in the Milky Way, although it looks like that, but it's really a representation for you of uh, that super connectivity of all things, right? The internet of things we hear about this. This is sort of ev that uh, on, on steroids of, almost. Um, so think about now, just in the last decade, how many more millions, if not billions, of servers we have in our country. Um, we now use the cloud regularly. Uh, smartphones and other kinds of smart devices are becoming much more ubiquitous. And sensors. There's been a huge growth in sensors. So now we're censoring out buildings, we're censoring out cars, we're censoring on the generation side, we're censoring on the load side, and we're gathering a lot more information about our energy ecosystem than we ever had before. And so as a result, we're collecting massive amounts of data. But we've got a solution for that too, because data analytics is on the rise. And our ability, we heard a little bit of that today, our ability to, to analyze massive amounts of data and understand, develop an understanding about correlations and anomalies and what to do next, what to control. And that's some of the work that I'm doing uh, in uh, the building efficiency space. So now we can have this information exchange. Your water heater can talk to your light, can talk to your socket that your computer is plugged into, can talk to your utility can talk to you, maybe through the smartphone that you're holding in your pocket. And so we're really entering this future, if you will, of an ability to self-detect and diagnose 
and correct and really autonomously control in ways that we only imagined in the past. So the second component uh, that is influencing this smart energy revolution is really what I'll refer to as embedded intelligence. Of course, data analytics plays a role in that too. But this idea that everything's becoming smarter, that your dishwasher, that your heating system, that the car that you drove here in today, everything's becoming smarter. Companies like Whirlpool and Toyota, those kinds of companies are out there embedding more and more intelligence into those devices. And now if we can leverage this with the super connectivity, then now all of these devices on this energy ecosystem are able to transmit and receive instructions. And that then contributes to the optimization, the management of that energy ecosystem in a much different way uh, than it did before. So let's go back to smart devices. We were talking about that. Now we're able to gather information about you, the energy consumer. Perhaps you might opt in or perhaps you might opt out. But just like the IT revolution was driven by consumer needs, think about uh, the fact that we can use blogs and social networks and video platforms to customize what we want to get out of some kind of learning environment, for example. Now we're moving into that realm with energy. And now an ability for you to have that choice. You can decide whether or not to put solar panels on your roof. You can decide how much you might want to vary, how much you want to pay for that thermostat setting to be at a certain level. That this self-production and self-customization of energy is, is certainly influencing that energy ecosystem of the future. And then the third critical component we'll call distributed resources. And we saw that again in the energy ecosystem and all the devices that are coming to play. We have solar on rooftops. We have local wind turbines. We have batteries for buildings. We just heard a lot about batteries. We have smart thermostats. We have water heaters that are no longer just water heaters anymore. They're used for thermal storage to manage the peak uh, variability on the grid. We have you, the connected consumer. And so what you hear a lot about all of this, these distributed resources is that they cause variability, that utilities are a little scared about all of this variability that they never had before. Utilities used to think that buildings were just a static resistor at the end of the line, and they're no longer that anymore. But the thing is, is that this variability that is caused these devices can also be the solution to that variability because they provide more flexibility. They provide the, a level of control to give you just the right amount of energy when you need it. And you see that coal power plants can't respond fast enough in those small amount of, of energy needs. They can't provide you. Turning on a coal power plant, right, will give you many tens or, or of megawatts or more of electricity. We need the kind of variability and response across the system at a variety of different levels. And the distributed resources provide us that ability. Um, so that the solar and the wind and certainly uh, batteries and variable loads can be used to better manage in real time the energy requirements of our country. So we're finally able to uh, optimize our energy ecosystem for cost, for efficiency, for reliability, for security, for resiliency, and for your user satisfaction. That's a, a huge jump from where we've been over the last century or so. To be able to manage for all of those things provides us a much more optimized system. We'll be able to, we'll, we'll be collecting sensor data on a continual basis, monitoring system health, looking at your user preferences and how they change. Certainly energy prices play a role here. Weather patterns, regulations, state by state, city by city, being able to understand that globally and at a small, minute level. Taking smart software and running simulations, thousands of simulations per second, in order to be able to figure out what's the best optimized operation 
of this particular grid system for the next hour or for the next minute. Advanced artificial intelligence algorithms that are able to kind of learn as they go and adapt and change the simulations on the fly because of some unusual activity that might be happening. And as we heard before, energy storage is really the linchpin to all of this. These batteries, big and small, that address the intermittency of solar and wind so that, again, we, we can actually value solar and wind in a new way so that their value contribution to the grid is the same as the more conventional sources we're using today. So uh, at Case Western Reserve University and in partnership with a lot of uh, industry partners that we have as well as uh, a major utility partner and uh, the Department of Energy and Pacific Northwest, we're working on a uh, demonstration in northern Ohio uh, that is a living laboratory of this future grid, as we call it. The, a place for these new algorithms and predictive models and energy trading platforms to coexist so that we can run this in real time and understand the benefits, so that we can make the case for companies to develop new solutions, new innovative solutions to penetrate onto the market, to make the case for utilities, to make the case for um, uh, utility commissions as well, that maybe we should be looking at different rate cases because of the technology enhancements that are coming to the grid. So that we end up with a smart campus and a smart city and a smart country and a smart planet. But smart beyond this idea of demand response. This is a, this is a transactive type environment where we truly understand the value. The value to you, be it your energy or energy efficiency requirements, be it cost, be it reliability, be it security, be it comfort, be it your own user satisfaction, whatever that value is, all of that taken into consideration in order to truly optimize the grid. So I'm going to give you a quick example um, of what I mean by a transactive platform here. So this is a, a platform. We've got solar. We've got wind. We've got the traditional grid. We have some smart buildings here. And let's say we're in the future. We're on our, our system at, um, uh, on a campus somewhere, in a city somewhere. And the utility communicates that the price is about to increase for energy. So this is an idea of real-time pricing, which I believe really is in our future. It's about to increase from 10 cents a kilowatt hour to a dollar a kilowatt hour, unless somehow 100 megawatts is removed from a, the system. So this is a price incentive here. And so a hotel in the system says, oh, no, no, I can't participate in that. I've got the Carnegie Mellon Energy Week conference going on. And so I need maximum cooling for my building. Um, and reaches out to that sort of bidding network and says, I'm looking to buy somebody else's additional load reduction to avoid the price increase. So I don't want to pay a dollar, but I'll pay between 10 cents and a dollar in, in order to make sure that I have what I need. Well, a big box store nearby says, well, I've got variable speed fans, and I've already run tests, and I've got a really smart building, and I know that to give you the amount of energy that you need for the amount of time that you need it, I can run those fans at a somewhat lower speed for about 10 minutes. And my customers, they're not even going to notice. Maybe I'll pump in music a little bit louder. And uh, it makes no noticeable difference. And then the big box store ends up making money as a result. And so in the end, that was, yeah, that was all I had. But in the end, we end up with this situation where everybody's happy, where it's really a win-win. Now, of course, we can't just have two buildings that are transacting together. We need a multiple buildings. We need a whole system of buildings to reach 100 megawatts, negotiating and controlling across that whole system autonomously um, and automatically aggregating to really make sure that it is a solution for the utilities and it's a solution for the customers. So I'm here to tell you that this is the future and we're really just at the beginning of the smart energy revolution. Thank you. Okay. Let me ask you to talk about this too. OK. 
Okay, yeah, so. sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> before we lose Alexis, uh, I want to ask her a couple of questions. First of all, describe your dress. Oh, sure. So uh, I was in Vietnam this winter, and uh, I went into a dress shop, and it was phenomenal and, and very artist-like person uh, designing all of these cool dresses. And he had one of the grid in Vietnam. So I said, I have to buy that. Um, and so you can see sort of the, gr the grid uh, structure here, and there's uh, transformers there and across here, and then wires connecting. And the back's even a mess, right? Because in Vietnam, the wires are all over the place. I'm sure you've seen pictures like that before. And so it's, it's just a big mess. And he was, he, it's great. He, was, he loved seeing that and had to turn it into a piece of art, so. <laughs> this, is, this is commitment to one's work. That's right. Uh, and I've asked Alexis to take uh, three or five minutes to say something about the Great Lakes Energy Institute, because I think especially the Carnegie Mellon audience would like to know more about that. Absolutely. Please. So the Energy Institute's been around since about 2008. Um, we are really focused on making uh, teams of people focused on energy with respect to research and commercialization more successful. Um, that's what we're in the business of. I say at the Energy Institute, we do three things. We help uh, the university, uh, our faculty, our students, our partners focus in areas of energy that we think are the up and coming areas. So looking at that intersection of the strengths of the university and the opportunities that are out there in the marketplace or with the federal government. Um, the second thing that we do is uh, really a lot of connecting and convening. So just like here at Carnegie Mellon, we believe collaborations and partnerships are the way to really have that kind of impact. And so we do a lot of getting uh, people together to respond to proposal calls, to start thinking ideating around ideas um, around energy. Um, and then the third thing we do is I like to say we empower our teams to be more successful. We help write proposals. Um, our success rate for proposals is about 50%. So for those of you who, who write proposals for a living, I'm sure a lot of you in this room have in, been involved in one way or another. Uh, that's pretty good. So we really know the formula to use. Um, in terms of trying to put together successful large proposals. Um, we do uh, commercialization assistance. So uh, we have our commercialization manager who's participating on Wednesday at, uh, at the clean tech up, uh, Allegheny. Allegheny, I'm sorry, Allegheny clean tech. clean tech Prize. Okay, all the regions have different names, so I have to keep them straight. But um, so the commercialization side, both with faculty and students helping with that, um, business development, we have a lot of good ways to connect with companies that are out there. Um, and also uh, project management. So once you get that grant, once you're working on a team, how do we help you continue s to be successful in that way? So it's great to see all the exciting energy activities going on at CMU, and we look forward to more collaborations and partnerships here with the university. Great. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks. Um, please join me in thanking you again for coming over.